Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Diana Martin. I'm the executive director here at Hourglass, and I'd like to welcome you to today's forum on the future of the Lancaster train station area. Lancaster County Planning recently released a Lancaster train station area, a uh, small area plan, that's right, the technical title, and um, it calls for putting the tools in place to redevelop the area as a gateway community with a combination of mixed land uses, high density housing, and bike and pedestrian friendly accommodations. Ooh. Today we're joined by Michael Doman, Principal Planner for Lancaster County Planning, who is going to present that vision and talk about the next steps for making it a reality. We're also joined by Ben Lesher, President and Founder of Parcel B Development Company, to speak about his new project, The Yards, a proposed mixed-use development right across the tracks that will consist of 226 apartments and retail space. Um, so after both their talks, we'll have time for questions. So dream with us in the audience and we'll get to hear from you um, in the last 15 minutes or so. Um, so thank you all so much for being here and thank you to our First Friday Forum sponsor, Rogers and Associates and Millersville University and the Ware Center for hosting us today. Um, all right, Mike, it's all you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. And thank you all for coming today. This is a really great turnout. Uh, it affirms my thinking towards the train station and the train station area that Lancastrians are generally excited about the opportunities that it affords. Uh, so I'm going to explain a little bit about the train station plan. So I, this, my slide shows up, is that correct? Oh, good. Okay. So let's go. Let's start with here. Um, this is the general area of the train station. So let me just give you some orientation. That little green star right there in the middle is the Lancaster train station. Um, it is at the interface of Lancaster City and Mannheim Township. If you're familiar with the boundaries uh, in this area, they are insane. Uh, <laughs> most likely formed from the annexations that occurred decades ago, but it makes it very, very challenging to plan for the area because it is so fragmented. Uh, the yellow circle you see there is a quarter mile radius around the train station. That is our primary study area. And in the black area around the edge, that is a what we call a 10 minute walk shed, but we're really focused on that yellow area. Uh, more orientation, you see the uh, train station. I, don't know, I can't see that red dot very well, but the train station below, um, uh, the train station is identified by the green um, star. McGovern Avenue is just south of that. Uh, the train tracks just to the north. To the north of the train tracks is the parcel known as uh, Keller Avenue. Um, and then Keller Avenue just to the north of that, we have the two pikes on the west Fruitville Pike, uh, coming across the railroad tracks on the Fruitville Pike Bridge and turning into Prince Street. And on the east side, we have Lidditz Pike, again, the Lidditz Pike Bridge coming into town, turning into Duke Street, Marshall <coughs> Avenue on the west, and Ben's project that he'll talk about is just on the uh, east side of Lidditz Pike, north, uh, south of Marshall Avenue. So how did the project, how did we get involved in this project? Well, back in 2021, uh, we were approached by the uh, Lancaster City Alliance, and they had indicated they, they were getting word there was going to be quite a few land changes, land use changes in and around the train station itself. And they asked if we would help facilitate uh, a process to coordinate those activities. Um, we agreed that that was a good idea, so we approached PennDOT and asked PennDOT if they would fund a refresh to the planning for that area. Um, PennDOT agreed with us that it was a great idea, and I say refresh because back in 2007, there was a plan for the area prepared. This is the Gateways Revitalization Strategy, completed in 2007. A tremendous document, great planning, Tremendous efforts went into it, but ultimately it failed um, and it was put on the shelf. I can't say really why it failed, but I will say that uh, the Great Recession of 2008 probably had a lot to do with that. 
So um, PennDOT did agree to provide some funding. Uh, we formed an advisory committee, and we began the process of planning in earnest probably at the beginning of 2022. So uh, we were asked, uh, I've been asked a number of times why the Planning Commission would be so interested in this tiny area, very small area in the county when our responsibilities are uh, for being the advisory for 60 municipalities in Lancaster County. I hope these next few slides really demonstrate why the County Planning Commission took on this project and why we feel it is one of the most important projects in the community right now. So uh, I'll begin with back in the early 90s, the County Planning Commission developed what's called a growth management strategy for our community. And the primary tool for that growth man management strategy was the use of urban growth boundaries. If you're not familiar with an urban growth boundary, it is a line on a map around one of our 18 boroughs in the community or the city of Lancaster. Within that boundary, we are encouraging uh, zoning that uh, calls for high density, mixed use, compact development with a full range of public utilities and facilities. Outside that uh, boundary, we are discouraging all growth and we use tools like effective agricultural zoning uh, to prevent development from going outside of the urban growth boundaries. That has worked really well for us. Um, our agricultural preservation entities in Lancaster County have been extremely effective, both the Ag Preserve Board and the Lancaster Farmland Trust. They've preserved approximately 120,000 acres of farmland in Lancaster County. They are, it's perpetually preserved forever, um, and that makes us number one in the country. Along with those urban growth boundaries, we had two goals related to location and pattern. As far as location, our goal was to have 85% of all new development occur inside the urban growth boundaries. And the good news is that we've been able to accomplish that. We are about 84, 85% of all new developments occurring inside the urban growth boundaries. So those boundaries have been successful in regards to the location. We haven't do, done so well in relationship to the pattern of development in Lancaster County. The goal for the central Lancaster County uh, urban growth boundary, or what we call the metro area now, is nine units per acre. So as you can see from this chart, in 2002 through 2015, I think it's, I don't know if I could see it at all there, but it's 4.2 uh, acres, uh, 4.2 units per acre. And in 2015 to 2019, it was about 5.5 .5 units per acre, so it's trending. But if you average those together, we have only been developing residential density at about 4.7 units per acre uh, inside the urban growth boundary in our metro area. That's about half of what we need to do. And why we need to develop those densities is because if we are using the land inside our urban growth boundaries efficiently, we're going to have to expand our urban growth boundaries to accommodate our projected population in Lancaster. And we don't want to do that. Nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to expand those boundaries, take on more farmland in our community. So it's important for us to develop at densities that are efficient, uh, and use the land that's efficient inside the urban growth boundary. And the train station area are, is one of those areas that we'd like to target. The second one uh, that I'd like to talk about is the mobility hub concept. In 2019, the Lancaster County Planning Department worked with the City of Lancaster County, the City of Lancaster Planning and developed a plan called the Active Transportation Plan. Active transportation, if you're not familiar with it, is, is basically uh, promoting the use and modes of alternate, alternative transportation, such as biking and walking. Uh, one of the concepts in the active transportation plan that we employed in the county in our comprehensive plan is the use of mobility hubs. If you're not familiar with the concept of a mobility hub, it is an area of convergence of different modes of transportation. So if you think about uh, the Lancaster train station, you have a convergence of different types of transportation there. You can drive your car and park, although parking is a problem and we'll talk about that. 
uh, you can walk there on the sidewalk network. You can ride your bike on the street network or the facilities that are available that the city is developing. And you can lock your bike up there too and leave it. Uh, you can pick up a taxi. You obviously have passenger rail there too and you can catch an RRTA bus. So this is an area of transportation convergence and we call that a primary mobility hub. The, the, the element that's missing there is the land use part of it. There's so much underutilized and uh, land around there that the mobility hub isn't as effective as it could be. Uh, affordable housing. We are in a crisis in Lancaster County. I think I don't have to tell anybody that. Uh, this is a serious issue in our community. Um, back in February of this year, there was a, an opinion piece in the Lancaster paper that just astounded me. Uh, in 2020, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development estimated that Lancaster County needed 18,000 new affordable units just to keep up with the demand. 18,000. That's remarkable. Um, the Economic Development Company of Lancaster County recently produced a document where they looked at Lancaster City and they determined that the vacancy rate for housing in the city is 2%. That's basically only uh, on the market. There's 2.2% uh, uh, homes on the market right now. And the retail market is 2.5%. 5 to 10% is considered a healthy vacancy rate. So we have a housing problem in Lancaster County, and we need to develop more densely. We need more units in the land that we have available inside the urban growth boundary. And finally, through this process, we were told by Amtrak definitively that the overwhelming majority of people who use the passenger rail service in Lancaster County arrive by car and look for parking. Parking is a major problem at the train station. It's being addressed by PennDOT. Uh, PennDOT purchased a three point, whoops, a 3.7 acre parcel of land on the north side of the railroad tracks and they're building a 250 space parking lot. That will be connected with a pedestrian overpass that's being constructed for a total cost of $24.5 million. It's a huge project. Despite the fact that most people are arriving to the train station and searching for parking spaces, which means that there's not a lot of people walking to the station, it is a successful train station. It is the second busiest Amtrak station in all of Pennsylvania and the 21st busiest in the nation, but we can do better. Can you imagine if the areas north of the train station in particular were developed with high density, compact, mixed use development that promoted walking and biking instead of people looking for parking spots, spaces, how much more efficient and effective the train station would be? And that's what this plan is all about. So there's really two elements to our plan. There is the actual planning document itself, which is about an inch thick and filled with all kinds of data, including existing conditions. We looked at existing land use and zoning, transportation, and, and other things. And we looked at previous and related plans, including that gateway plan that was done in 2007. We looked at um, the comprehensive plan for Mannheim Township and the comprehensive plan for the city of Lancaster and our comprehensive plan. We, did, uh, we conducted pub public engagement in which we had two open houses. Uh, we had um, interviewed about 80 stakeholders in this process, including some major landowners in that area. We also conducted a design charrette for the property itself. That went through a number of iterations until uh, it was refined by the Lancaster County Planning Department uh, Director of, of, of Analy well, Analyst and Design, I'm sorry, yes, uh, John Hershey, uh, sitting right here. Um, he really took that design to the next level, and what you'll see today is his work. And finally, we have recommendations and uh, implementation. 
So one of the most important process, uh, things to do in a process like this is to develop a consensus on a vision for the future. And it took us a while to get here with all the different factors of, of uh, people involved in the committee, but we did finally. And this is the consensus on the vision for the Lancaster train station area. The Lancaster train station area will be a cohesive and well-designed urban gateway neighborhood, safely connecting all transportation modes and attractive to a diverse mix of residents, housing and businesses that is compatible with and supportive of increased transit ridership. This vision really informed the design that I'm about to show you here. This is the a couple of caveats with this design first. Number one, this is one of a thousand ways that this site could be developed, but this was just our approach to it. Also, we did this without regard to existing zoning. We did not follow the zoning regulations in Mannheim Township or the city of Lancaster. We completely ignored them uh, to do this design, and we had to, to make it work. And again, part of that is, part of that is because you know, the area is so fragmented. Um, between the two municipalities. So let me just describe a little bit what's going on here in this design. Um, you will see on the right, oops, I keep doing that. On the uh, right hand side, uh, we have Lidditz Pike. Can't see that. I can't see the dot, but anyway. On the right hand side, we have Lidditz Pike and the Lidditz Pike Bridge coming into the city, turning into Duke Street. To the very uh, east of uh, the Lidditz Pike Bridge, you'll see Ben's project that he'll speak about uh, coming up. To the left side, we have Fruitville Pike coming in and the Fruitville Pike Bridge turning into uh, Prince Street. On the north side, we have Keller Avenue. And on the south side, fronting the Lancaster train station, is McGovern Avenue. So, in regards to the transportation network, there are two realignments. Um, on Keller Avenue to the north, um, we are removing that dog leg, leg as you approach the intersection of Mannheim, Pike, Fruitville, and Keller Avenue. And to the south of the train station, you will see McGovern uh, realigned with Lincoln Avenue there um, so that it makes a more effective uh, and safer transportation uh, intersection. The Buildings in red with numbers are new buildings. There are 31 new structures on this property. Three of them are parking garages. But the buildings in red with numbers are new buildings that are either four or five stories in height, with the bottom floor being commercial or office, and residential above. The buildings in yellow with numbers are also new buildings, but they're only three stories in height to respect the uh, area neighborhood. The gray buildings, number four, you see there on the left above the railroad tracks is a parking garage, as is the building south of McGovern Avenue, uh, the gray one behind, I think that's either 25 or 26, I can't see it from here, is a parking garage that they, those parking garages are needed to accommodate the density of this development. I think some people get a little bit confused thinking there's a lot of parking on this parking lot per se, but we're talking about four and five story buildings here. So there is going to be a lot of residential uh, development in here and a lot of people living in this area. So it really isn't that much parking uh, overall for the density of development that we're talking about. The striped building, gray building in the middle above the railroad tracks is a potential future uh, parking structure that would be three floors uh, high. And it is being, on this plan, constructed on the surface parking lot that PennDOT is building. The two striped red buildings are also new, new proposed or potential buildings that would be liner buildings to that parking structure itself. Uh, and as you can see on the right, far right-hand side above, there is a potential new building at the corner of Marshall and Lidditz Pike, which would take the existing office building that's located there and bring it up to the intersection. There is a uh, bicycle uh, bikeway here uh, running from uh, the Mannheim Pike, Fruitville Pike, Keller Avenue intersection through the development and connecting to 
the intersection with Lidditz Pike. There's also a bikeway in the southern end, south of the train station, running from uh, Prince Street over to Duke Street. Um, there are a couple of decisive open spaces as part of this project. There is a plaza that's built here, fronted by Building 16, a play area to the west adjacent to Fruitville Pike, and then there's also a more formal plaza in the front yard of the Lancaster train station with a water feature. These are some renderings from what this development could potentially look like. So on the north end of the train station, this perspective is from Keller Avenue, looking towards that plaza and water fountain in front of Building 16. And back here, you can see the tower that's being constructed for that pedestrian bridge over the railroad tracks. Um, this is a, the one on the right-hand side up top is a, another view of that. Here is the fountain in the plaza, the railroad pedestrian bridge tower located here also. On the bottom, this bikeway is at the intersection of Lidditz Pike and Marshall that would run through the development, as I said, on the northern end. And here we're looking uh, due east with the tower from the train station here, located here, and the plaza on the left-hand side. This is a view from the southern side of the train station uh, project. We're sitting at the top left-hand corner here. We're sitting at the intersection of Prince and McGovern, looking due east. Here's the Lancaster train station and the plaza in the front with the water feature. And on the right-hand side is a new building that would replace that existing building that is there with the comic book store, essentially. On this side is just a, another perspective of the train station with the fountain. And on the bottom, we are on McGovern Avenue, looking west with the train station on the right, that new building on the left. Now, part of this analysis, and people were worried about, well, what about all the parking? Well, we did a parking analysis and a density analysis as part of this. This is just one of seven different iterations we did. And I picked this iteration because this is the most ideal uh, development scenario that we could imagine. Basically, I'm showing all the buildings on that uh, development, that development uh, illustra site concept illustration as being built. Um, so this is everything. This is the most ideal scenario. And what we come up with is a total number of 31 buildings with three parking garages and a total square foot of commercial retail office space of about 256,325 square feet. That's certainly bigger than your typical uh, Walmart. The total number of residential buildings on a four-story mixed-use design would be 794, and it would accommodate about 900 to 1,200 residents. But we would be shooting for at least this five-story mixed-use building scenario where we'd have close to 1,000 units and a gross density of about 30 units per acre which sounds like a lot until you hear Ben's project is 50 units per acre. Um, that would accommodate between 12 and 1,500 residents in the area. And again, for the five-story uh, scenario, we would need uh, three parking structures, each with three floors. The parking structure built on the surface parking lot of PennDOT would have to accommodate the uh, train passenger users for the space for them. So what's next? Um, we are going to ask the municipalities, both Lancaster City and Mannheim Township, to adopt this plan. That would be a good indication to us that they are supportive and want to move forward. If that happens, we will facilitate the formation of a multi-municipal work group, and we will begin working on zoning consistency. So the final thing I want to say is that we are extremely fortunate in Lancaster County to have this facility. There are 20 metro areas in the United States that are larger than Lancaster County that don't have passenger rail service. So I think we're really fortunate. We have a great uh, rail station, but we can even make it better. Thank you.
Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Mike. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, thanks to Hourglass and Diana for inviting me. Um, I was asked to speak about uh, one of the projects I'm working on called The Yards, which uh, Mike referenced a little bit. Um, again, my name is Ben Lesher, uh, president of Parcel B uh, Development Company. Um, try to go quickly through this. I see many familiar faces, but uh, many I don't know as well. Um, I uh, got started actually in real estate development, um, kind of cutting my teeth working for the Dragaris companies in Lancaster many years ago. Um, have an educational background in urban planning, um, worked in affordable housing finance and development for a few years, um, and about three years ago, uh, went out on my own and, and started my own company. Uh, and the, the first project was Stadium Row, uh, which many of you are probably uh, familiar with. Uh, so I want to just do some kind of high-level um, bullets and, and goals about the yards um, and what we're trying to accomplish. So, of course, this is a transit-oriented development by virtue of its location to the train station and also is served by uh, a couple bus routes as well. And, um, you know, we really wanted to try to cr uh, create a vibrant um, kind of gateway into the city, and we also wanted to add some uh, commercial first floor space to help um, kind of uh, activate the street and um, yeah, just add some variety to the development. Um, you know, my focus in development is mostly around multi-family uh, housing. I'm always looking to uh, maximize the number of housing units that I can build on a site for a variety of reasons. Um, here we're looking at over 200 units. Again, we're also responding to the need for housing in the city and the county, um, particularly in this project. Um, we have a goal to try to get 20% of the units, which is 45 uh, to an affordable uh, price point. And uh, thirdly, we have an incredible opportunity to preser uh, preserve a historic uh, resource here. I'm sure many of you have enjoyed uh, the Stockyard Inn, and um, we are looking to retain part of that, um, but uh, the southern uh, end, if you will, is the most uh, historic, the oldest part. Um, but we are looking to relocate that, and that helps us get a more efficient uh, layout, build more housing units. Um, it also allows us to create a better urban edge and site design. And uh, lastly, um, you know, Mike already talked about this for the whole area. This is an underutilized site and just a wonderful infill opportunity. Um, you know, there's a lot of public infrastructure, utilities, transportation right here. Uh, and again, if we want to preserve farmland and, and natural space uh, in other parts of the county, this is probably where we do a little window into my brain, actually, and in, in the approvals and what I'd call the entitlement process that it takes. Um, to get these projects uh, going. And you can also get a sense of some of the competing interests that we have to deal with um, that add, can add time and cost to the process. Um, and so May in 2021 is when we purchased the property. Uh, we went to zoning and that took several months uh, to get our approvals. Um, if you've been following the news or anything, you've realized we have some challenges there, even though we did get our approval. Um, you know, then we moved on to the Historic Commission, and um, you know, we definitely uh, had to come back uh, a few times uh, to get it right, and I'm happy with what we landed on, um, but that took um, some time um, to go through that. Um, next, uh, it took some time to apply for some of the creative financing sources that are needed to get the affordable housing in the project. Um, and then we kind of moved into uh, kind of sketch plan and submitting our land development plan to the city, which is kind of the final kind of review process at the municipal level. Um, of course, as part of that, we have to go to traffic commission, shade tree commission. Um, we did get our final uh, land development plan um, in March. Uh, there's still conditions that we need to satisfy uh, for that. Um, some of those are uh, the next two bullets, which are state level uh, approvals, NPDS permit, which has to do with stormwater. And I know this gets really technical, but that takes a long time. Um, we probably don't expect to get that till maybe the end of the year. Um, 
And then we have the sewer planning module. Um, kind of an interesting tidbit with that process is it triggers a review by the State Historic Preservation Office. Um, and that required some archaeological studies. Um, and some, you know, they are also concerned, even though it's for sewer, they're concerned about making sure we um, preserve historical resources and do appropriate mitigation. Uh, so just to orient you a little bit, and, and Mike already did some of this, um, you can see where, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with where the Stockyard Inn is located, um, right here. Um, I am showing the municipal boundary here. Uh, a lot of people think this is in Mannheim Township, or partially in Mannheim Township. It is actually entirely in the city of Lancaster. Um, and. Um, it has a lot of benefits, I would say, especially from zoning. It allows um, for uh, more density, basically taller buildings. It has a little bit less parking requirements as Mannheim Township. This is the uh, existing site as it sits today. Um, so uh, here's the Stockyard Inn, um, and then here's the former Jimmy's Deluxe building. Um, that will be demolished, as well as this uh, kind of northern wing or L. Um, and then, like I said, we're going to be moving this portion up to this corner uh, here. And uh, you can see uh, in, the, in the purples where the relocated inn will be, we'll be building a nice new uh, modern porch to it. It'll have some nice outdoor amenity, pool space, green space, uh, dog run. Um, and again, like I mentioned earlier, the relocation of this allows us to build uh, much more efficiently, get more density in th with the new buildings. Um, and that's, we have building A and building B in the orange. It also allows us to bring the buildings up to the edge of the street um, and really start to build that urban edge. And that's one of the things that I try to do is like, um, you know, build these kind of liner buildings and create this uh, nice urban streetscape. So we have some commercial along Marshall Ave. Um, and then the other piece of what we're trying to do here is, is also hide the parking as much as possible. So either behind buildings or underneath buildings. Um, you know, parking is a huge um, challenge and it also drives a lot of development and site design. Um, the city requires one uh, parking space per apartment here. Um, we actually have a few more than that. Um, we've found at Stadium Row, for example, we actually need a little bit more parking than that. Here, unfortunately, we don't have nice walkable um, off-site parking that's available here. Um, so we, we felt like we needed to add a little bit more um, than what was required. Um, I would have loved to try to do more kind of street activation on Lidditz Pike. Um, I will note this triangle. This is uh, owned by PennDOT and is a stormwater uh, detention basin or BMP um, that kind of serves the overpass. Obviously, with the bridge and the overpass, that creates uh, some challenges too, just in terms of uh, building next to it. Um, another, you know, uh, increasingly uh, bigger challenge and something to deal with is stormwater management. Um, you know, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the city and its combined sanitary storm s system has uh, even more challenges when has the, they the have the consent decree, um, which if they don't um, do more mitigation and um, reduce some of that, they're going to be facing some serious uh, fines. Um, I will say, fortunately, for this project, we actually have a lot of area um, compared to many other sites. This is kind of an enormous site um, for the city, and this allows us to do stormwater infiltration, um, which is one of the best kind of cost-effective uh, ways to manage stormwater. So we're able to do that, and that's the areas you see here uh, in pink. Um, you know, I'm working on other sites in the city closer to downtown that are much smaller, and it's incredibly challenging to do this without losing significant density in housing units, um, and to the point where it just it also makes projects infeasible. So here's an image that we put together for the Historical Commission submission, and this gives you a sense of 
um, kind of obviously what we're proposing to build. Um, but you can see in the blue uh, shaded area kind of massing. That's sort of what is allowed under the current zoning um, regime in Mannheim Township. Um, so I believe that's like a three-story building. I think you can go to four stories with transferable development rights, which are difficult to secure. Um, but again, sort of like what Mike was saying, you know, it'd be great to see some zoning changes um, on that side to allow, you know, we're able to build a five-story um, building um, on our side of the street. Um, also, I think Manheim Township is like what requires one and a half parking spaces per unit on their side, which is still honestly pretty good compared to a lot of other places. But again, it would be great to see that maybe closer to one to one. Uh, here's just another image, and again, you can see um, just trying to build that urban streetscape. Um, on the left, that's the relocated uh, stockyard in building. Um, again, it'd be great if this was sort of mirrored on the other side. Uh, you know, the other side is a much more suburban development with the bu building way back and, and parking out in front. Here's another image um, kind of going north out of the city. And this just gives you another sense of the overall um, kind of site. Obviously, the relocated N is here in the foreground. Uh, here's another image kind of looking west down Marshall Avenue. So let me like switch gears a little bit and talk about um, the housing component and the affordable housing component. Um, you know, I'm sure many of you are aware of the need for housing in the city and the county. Um, you know, this project is proposing to try to not only provide obviously market rate housing, but some affordable units. Um, and specifically trying to get to 60% of area median income levels. And to give you a sense of what that actually means, these are the current rent levels and household income limits for that. Um, so I don't, I'm curious what folks, when they see that, if they feel or think that's affordable or not. Um, but to put it in context with this project, they are about uh, $500 less on average uh, than what we project the market rate rents to be. And the other thing I'll note is some recent housing studies, particularly in the city, have shown kind of this mismatch between having a lot of smaller households, like one and two people, persons, um, but the housing stock is a larger share of multi-bedroom, uh, multi, uh, yeah, multi bedroom units. Um, so again, at the yards, we're responding to this with a lot of smaller units. Uh, we saw this at Stadium Row, the studios, smaller one bedrooms have been um, in high demand. You know, one of the things I'm trying to do here is a mixed uh, income housing approach, and there's several benefits to that. Um, you know, again, I believe that we need new housing units at all levels, and that'll help ease the pressure uh, on rents across the board. Um, but also there's an urgent need um, for um, units at lower price points. Um, you know, another um, thing with a mixed income approach is you can use some more kind of traditional or conventional um, financing sources and loans, and that allows you to be a little more cost effective sometimes and also quicker um, to build it. Um, and of course, there's just general benefits of creating more diverse uh, communities for everyone. So I want to talk a little bit about the approach that I'm taking with this project here. Um, so it's essentially trying to replace some of the private equity, if you will, uh, with some lower cost kind of social impact funds, either from private sources or even public funds uh, and grants. And just to put this in perspective, um, in this case, it's taking $110,000 per unit to essentially convert a market rate unit to an affordable unit. And that's like over a 20 year affordability period. And so that's, that's a lot. <laughs> um, in this case, to do all 45 units, I probably need about $7 million to do that. 
So it's, it's a pretty big uh, nut to crack. So uh, some of the funding sources that I've um, started to pursue already, um, you know, there's different housing funds that are sort of soft debt. I applied and was awarded uh, ARPA funds, both from the city and county. Uh, I see Ray's here, so thank you um, for that. Um, I've also talked to some local foundations and private individuals that are interested in maybe making a social impact uh, investment to make the affordable housing projects work. So um, just to kind of, I, I guess, wrap it up and synthesize some of this and my kind of thinking and philosophy um, is just, the problem is we really haven't built enough housing and um, it, you know, I, there's been some studies done nationally that I think over the last 10 years we've underbuilt by like 5 million units or something crazy. Um, and so, right, I think we're all like, well, let's build some more housing. You know, but the problem is it's, it's hard, it's difficult, and um, there's a lot of rules um, and restrictions. Um, you know, in sort of economic terms, it's high barrier to entry. Um, and there's a lot of competing interests in this work and just thinking about all the steps and processes that I had to go through that I showed you earlier. Um, you know, I would say these are all generally good things. They come with a good intention to kind of make sure we all live uh, safely and, and healthily. Um, but they add time and cost. And sometimes we have to decide if we're gonna prioritize one uh, over the other. And so I think that's just like as a community, what thinking about what do we want to prioritize because we can't really have it all. Um, you know, uh, we do live in a world of, of scarce resources, I would argue. Um, and uh, so that's kind of the gist of, of, of what I'm trying to propose is just to start thinking about these things. Um, and one of the sort of, I guess, clear examples from the yards is, you know, um, to pre preserve that historic resource and relocate it, you know, that might cost a million, a million and a half dollars, and that's wonderful, it's gonna be awesome. Um, but, you know, one might say, I might say, like, let's put that towards some affordable housing units, you know. Um, you know, others might wanna see more, uh, better stormwater mitigation, I don't know. Um, so I think that's, that's the kind of discussion and, and things we need to be thinking about. Um, and then obviously costs are, are going up and it's just making everything more difficult. Um, this gives you a sense of kind of where we're at with the yards. Um, and uh, quite honestly, other, other projects that I'm hearing and seeing, um, that number is, is, is much higher. And um, by the time we get construction, uh, this might be higher as well too. So that's it. Thanks for presenting both of you. Great job. Um, ben, you deserve a uh, merit award or something when you look at those list of competing interests. <clears throat> I think you probably answered my initial question of which one would be the biggest headache. Uh, but I'm curious, when you go back and look at the design, why you, were you required to move the, the building? It seems like you could have designed around it otherwise. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, you know, we looked at trying to incorporate it and keep it where it is. Um, it really came back to this idea of, of where it sits today um, was based on uh, previous roadways and things. And so it sits back. And one, it wouldn't allow for efficient layout to get the kind of unit density that we wanted to meet housing needs, but also economic feasibility for the project. Um, but I think here it also allows us to push the new buildings up to the street to try to create that kind of urban edge um, and streetscape that, you know, I think the city and, and many others, myself included, wanted to see. Questions? Hi, um, I'm curious, it seems like you threaded a very tricky needle here, so like love the, love this whole vision. Um, 
when I look at the proposal with all of the parking and like by the standards of larger cities, actually quite short buildings, I wonder what we can do about that requirement for parking being at one unit, one car per unit, I think you said it is in the city, uh, in Philadelphia or in New York or any larger city, like that's way too much parking still. What do we do about that going into the future? I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, for me, at the end of the day, like I have to, I have to lease an apartment, and they have to pay rent so I can make this whole thing work. And at this point, people need a need a car generally, want a car, and need a place to park it. Um, so, you know. The answer that I have isn't a simple or easy one, but we need to build better probably transit systems. Um, you know, in the cities that you mentioned, they have more robust transit systems. Yes, we have the Amtrak station, but um, you know, some of the other transit systems we have um, aren't as robust as I think we need it to, to do that. Um, I will say in, in the central business district in Lancaster City, there's actually no parking uh, required. Um, so we do have that in the core of the downtown. Um, I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah, I'll just say that um, as part of our design, uh, we looked at both the parking requirements for Mannheim Township and the city. Mannheim Township, as been said, is 1.5 uh, parking spaces per unit. Uh, the city is one. We selected one as our option for this design. When we get into the discussions between Mannheim Township and the city, can we reduce that more? Yeah, I think we can, especially if we're designing this as a TOD or a transit-oriented development, which people are going to rely on this area for, uh, excuse me, the train itself as a way of transportation. If they're commuting to Philadelphia or Harrisburg, they don't need as much parking. So maybe we can reduce this more. I think that's going to be an important part of the discussion uh, with Mannheim Township and the city as we move forward with an ordinance that would either be an overlay for this area or a specific joint, jointly adopted ordinance, or we could tweak both ordinances to come more in com compliance. But we should be looking at lower parking requirements, especially if we're trying to attract people to live there that would want to use the passenger rail as their way of commuting. Um. I have a question about how, how the the plan for around the train station kind of develops into evolves into reality. Um, so I guess maybe correct me if my understanding's wrong, but what I heard you say is you know you sort of have this plan that you put together and you're trying to get you know the city and Manheim Township to kind of approve the zoning to to put it into action. But then at that point, um, you know to make it reality, developers have to come in and actually do it. Um, are they? chomping at the bit to do that? Are there incentives that are required to get, you know, to actually turn it into reality? It's going to be a, a difficult project. Uh, I'm not going to lie to you. But the first step in that process is to get the zoning that would allow for something like this to happen. Right now, that's not there. So they're not even talking about doing something remotely similar to what we've proposed at this point in time. However, um, We've been told by a few of the uh, the, develop, uh, the property owners there that if they had the opportunity to do something similar to this, if the zoning was changed, they would seriously consider it. Uh, that being said, in that area, our study area, there's about there's over 40 different landowners, and each has their own you know need and own perspective. So it's going to take uh, uh, quite an effort and a sustained long-term effort. Uh, from this community to get this to happen. But um, our goal here was to inspire, um, to you know, imagine what we could develop around the train station to make the train station even more of an asset for our community than it is today. Um, and I think we did this with the design. I think John did an amazing job on this, and uh, I'm really happy about the way it turned out, and it's excited a lot of people. At our public meetings, we've gotten nothing but positive com compliments from everyone. We've got some negative comments about the surface parking lot that PennDOT is building, 
And really, it's unfortunate that is a surface parking lot. We would have much rather seen structured parking lot that would allow us to build more density on the other side. But it is what it is right now. But we're hoping in the future that will change. PennDOT is open, you know, to uh, looking at something like that in the future. We're just going to have to put together the mechanisms uh, to make it happen. Can I, I'll just add something I think specific. I, um, it's, it's a great plan, and I think it's important work to do this visioning, but uh, it's hard for me to look at it and not, like I think about the zoning and all the reasons why it is gonna be difficult. Um, I think from a developer's perspective, um, structured parking is an incredibly expensive thing to do, and generally in Lancaster, in Lancaster County, we don't have the rents um, to support that kind of construction. And so to, to build the parking garage and the parking deck that you see there, personally, I think that that's gonna take some kind of public-private partnership um, where it's gonna be a long time until we have rents that can support that kind of structured parking, so. And we did have some conversations with Larry Cohen from the Parking Authority, and he is interested in working with us if this plan can move forward. Uh, I assume these units I assume these units are going to bring more wage earners into the area. I don't know what the anticipated ratio is per unit, 1.3 or whatever it might be. And uh, with the workforce structure changing to more people that work from home part-time and commute to work occasionally, I could see where it would be attractive to people that want to move to Lancaster work from home and only have to commute to Philly one or two days a week or whatever. Uh, but I haven't heard any input from Amtrak. So I know right now their current schedule is not gonna accommodate a lot more commuters because there's plenty of days they sell out, particularly the nice car, you know, where you can plug in your computer and that kind of stuff. And is Amtrak uh, even capable of increasing service given capital requirements for new cars, new trains, personnel, uh, they're not really on that sound financial basis. So is that, has anybody looked into that piece of it? Yeah, a Amtrak was on our committee. Um, Amtrak is not as optimistic as we are. <laughs> um, they don't project uh, a, growth, a growth in the the passenger service at the Lancaster train station for the foreseeable future. Um, I'm hoping they're wrong. Uh, I will say right now that uh, pre-COVID numbers at the Lancaster train station, uh, they were servicing about 519,000 people uh, a year, 2019. That dipped in 21 to uh, 177,000. Last year, that was back up to 305. So it is trending, and they think that it's going to be even higher uh, this year. Their first six months, they, they're seeing much more traffic. So we might be getting back to that point where uh, Amtrak was before. Our hope is that if we can build something like this and get more people who want to live by the train station and use it as a method of commuting to work, that it would grow more. Um, the other interesting part is that Amtrak told us during this process that Lancaster is not a destination train station. It is an outgoing station. People aren't arriving in Lancaster as much as they're leaving. So that, I thought that was very interesting, which opens up an opportunity for us. If there is some employment opportunities developed close to the train station, a medical building or something like that, people could arrive at the, at the uh, station and work in that building and then travel home if they want. So it's an opportunity. Questions from the audience? Okay, let me wind my way over there. Here you go. I applaud your vision. Um, they're beautiful projects. What about traffic and the infrastructure leading into these? I see a lot of increased traffic. Ben's plan or my, my, our plan? <laughs> no, which one? <laughs> you go first, Mike. <laughs> you go first, Ben. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It, it will generate new traffic. Um, you know, we've done traffic studies and worked um, with the city. Um, you know, they're satisfied with, with the plan we have, have now. Um, we are working through some improvements at the signal and the intersection uh, with them. The city's priority, though, um, quite frankly, is pedestrian uh, safety uh, and walkability. So they're looking more at pedestrian improvements than, than concerns about traffic. In regards to the plan, um, the design, site design concept that we have is it is designed in a way um, that encourages walking and biking. It really is. And the mixed use would allow people to walk or bike or short drive for their daily needs. So, the immense amount of commercial property that you have, it absolutely could. Is it realistic to think that every one of those buildings that we have on that, uh, shown in red on there with a number, would have commercial and office on the first floor? Probably not. But we wanted to develop a scenario in which uh, we sort of maximized that and see what the parking needs were. Um, you know, the developer who builds this is going to have to determine, you know, how much commercial uh, and office space is needed. But I, pro I, my gut feeling is that it will not be every building that is shown on that plan. So it'll be less than 250,000 square feet of commercial <coughs> space. It's a Walmart. It's a bigger than Walmart, yeah. Yeah. We can probably take one more question. Is there anyone with a pressing question at the end here for our presenters? Um, if not, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much for being here and both of you um, for sharing your, your vision for the train station area. Um, we, will, we do have a video recording of today's talk, which we will put on our website and YouTube channel next week. So please feel free to share that with people who would benefit from this conversation. Um, our next First Friday Forum, we will be back here on June 2nd. We will be hearing from Lancaster History about their new Thaddeus Stevens and Lydia Hamilton Smith Center for History and Democracy. That's been making some really exciting progress, so excited to share an update on that. Um, to receive an invitation to all of our events, you can become an Hourglass member on our website at hourglasslancaster.org. Um, we're also working on a really neat event with the city that will be down in Steinman Auditorium on Wednesday, June 7th on community engagement uh, for local democracy. So keep your eyes peeled for that. That'll be a free event and hope people can join us. So until then, have a great weekend. Thanks for being here.